All right, rounding out our day one, and I can't believe I'm saying that because I feel like the time is absolutely flying. Uh, we have a very special treat for you. It is the Forum's inaugural film screening uh, of Stateless, a documentary by award-winning director Michelle Stevenson. We will be showing the first 26 minutes of this powerful work, which follows the families of those affected by the Dominican Republic's 2013 legislation stripping citizenship from Dominicans of Haitian descent. The film uncovers the complex history and present day politics of Haiti and the Dominican Republic through the grassroots electoral campaign of a young attorney named Rosa Iris. After the screening, editor in chief of the Haitian Times, Vanya Andre, will will sit with the film's producer and director, Michelle Stevenson, to delve into why these stories should matter to everyone. Plus, following the discussion, we will have time for audience Q&A. So as I mentioned a little bit earlier on in the day, use the Q&A function towards the bottom of your screen, and we will be pulling throughout the conversation um, some of those questions, and hopefully we'll be able to answer as many of them as possible towards the end of that dialogue. So get your questions coming in, okay? Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to present to you the forum's inaugural film, Stateless. Mi hijo, te quiero contar la historia de una niña que se llamaba Moraime. En una noche oscura de octubre, Moraime tuvo que esconderse. El dictador Trujillo decidió limpiar la raza y solucionar el llamado problema haitiano. Mató a muchos, a su mamá, por causa del color de su piel. Tiraron su cuerpo arrastrándolo por las aguas del río Masacre. por su vida. Y el acta yo tengo una copia aquí. Aquí hay una copia de la Sí, no, pero que la original no se la vamos a dejar. No, pero una copia de yo, Ok, yo. Ahí está. Ok. Ni tiene la acta actualizada que le piden, ni tiene la cédula. Sin embargo, él desde el 2013 no ha podido continuar sus estudios. Deme un permisito, joven. Deme un permisito. Gracias. Ven, ven. ¿Cómo está usted? Ya, ¿Cuál es tu nombre? ¿Cómo te llamas? Clemón. ¿Pero dile el nombre completo? Clemón. Bonnie. Bonnie. Dominicano tiene su acta con una declaración, tiene sus documentos, estudió aquí. ¿Eso de Clemón? De Clemón. Pero Clemón no habla español. ¿Que no habla español? O sea, no habla un español diáfano. Hable con él. Pero ya yo le hice la pregunta. Es que no es migrante, él es ciudadano dominicano igual que usted y que yo. 
Nosotros tenemos que entender eso. Nosotros no podemos estar discriminando a nuestros mismos compatriotas. Y yo soy la que Le está llamando extranjero a un compatriota suyo. A mí me causa molestia. ¿Por qué? Porque yo estoy hablando de una persona que nació aquí. Hago la aclaración en función de que sepamos de que no estamos hablando de un nacional haitiano, que no es lo mismo el que nace en Haití, que el hijo del haitiano que nace aquí. Tú vienes armado, yo también entonces tengo que armarme, porque yo sí tengo argumentos sí. con qué defender. Dominicano Danilo Medina y las autoridades han creado una especie de laberinto jurídico en relación a los miles de ciudadanos de procedencia haitiana que viven en su territorio. Todo ello se ha complicado aún más desde el devastador terremoto. ¿Tú sabes qué es apatridia? ¿Tú sabes qué es apatridia? La apatridia es la situación o la condición cuando una persona no tiene nacionalidad. Eso vendría siendo como los haitianos que son, que tienen, como por ejemplo, parte dominicana, o sea, son haitianos, pero nacieron aquí, entonces por esa razón no tienen sus, sus documentos. Más o menos. Imagínate que tu papá y tu mamá son extranjeros, ¿verdad? No te pudieron declarar. Ahora, en el 2010, nace una nueva ley. Con esa nueva ley quieren como que jugar a que tú no puedes adquirir la nacionalidad. Ahí entonces tú ni puedes tener la nacionalidad del país donde naciste, pero tampoco puedes tener la nacionalidad del país de tus padres. Eso es como son, pero no existen. Vamos. También quiero ir. Porfis, 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 porfis. Tú no puedes decir. Eh, hay cosas del trabajo que tú no puedes acompañar. Y esa es una de las cosas. Moray me corrió hacia la casa de sus vecinos. Tenía mucho miedo de esconderla. Moray me tuvo que huir. Estamos de vuelta con a partir de ahora y lo hacemos con un video que realmente indignó a la sociedad dominicana. El abogado General Rincón, quien fue agredido porque el abogado Rincón se ha distinguido por defender a los grupos que la sociedad hace vulnerables. Esa contusión me la produjo uno de ellos. Y luego esa herida me la produjo con un pedazo de blog. Puedo informar además también que tengo varias eh, eh, hematoma aquí porque también me dieron pedrada y también me pisaron con sus zapatos y me escupieron. Y entonces a ti me imagino que te tocó muy cerca esta situación porque el señor Rincón hace un trabajo muy parecido al que tú haces. Pero es peligroso cuando vemos que esa labor se ve de cierta forma torpedeada por agresiones que comienzan verbales y ya están terminando en agresiones físicas. Uh -huh. A eso me llama mucho la atención que se ha manifestado durante los últimos tres años que yo he estado de forma más activa en todo lo que es el activismo, defensa de derechos humanos, veo que sistemáticamente se está dando una agresión en redes sociales, pero no veo una respuesta del Estado. Eso es preocupante. Y se han denunciado varios hechos. Eh, este es uno de los temas que toca como que una parte muy sensible de la población dominicana, los dominicanos de ascendencia haitiana. 
Porque, gracias a Dios, Renaro sobrevivió. Pero, ¿y los demás? Ya. Que ellos entran para acá y nosotros no podemos entrar. Son personas, esas personas que usted dice que damos una celebración de comercio. Yo no puedo pasar de ahí para allá, pero ellos pueden entrar todo lo que quieran para acá. Sin, sin, sin presentar un pasaporte y un nada. No, no hemos visto a nadie ahí entrar. No, discúlpete, discúlpete mano. esa palabra que tú decías. Puede ir ahí a la puerta, tú salgas, tú entras. Él dijo que no, que yo no puedo. No, tú hablas con nada. Tú hablas con, eh, con los policías ya no. Con este, ya te vino. pasa tu vida entra. Ya te vino ahí este. No decir nada. Habla con este. Hasta este. la puerta. Hasta la puerta, tú voy a Hasta la puerta, tú vas a ir. Tú no sabes cuánto de nada. Los haitianos aquí matan, asaltan, picotean, porque yo es eso es la forma de ellos hacer las cosas. Casi todos los días un dominicano, una familia dominicana, y no pasa nada, y el gobierno nunca dice nada. Nosotros, movimientos nacionalistas, tenemos varias propuestas al Congreso. La primera medida que vamos a impulsar es la construcción del muro. Ya no van a haber esos 85 puntos de frontera donde los haitianos entren, porque van a ser totalmente cerrados. Ya ese proyecto eh, Israel, se lo propuso al presidente Hipólito Mejía y él no lo hizo. No hemos tenido un gobierno serio que haya querido enfrentar el tema de la inmigración. La nación, para nosotros los dominicanos, es nuestra casa grande. Nosotros vamos a seguir luchando hasta que esto se organice. Bien, gracias. Y estoy creciendo. Y quería venir, pero está bien. Okay. Yo necesito hacer ese mismo levantamiento, pero con información más detallada. ¿Me presta la copia del documento de la gobernación? Tengo como cuatro de los años. Los años de nacimiento. ¿Es la tuya? Yo estoy interesada en hacer este levantamiento de información. Saber cuánta gente tiene esto. Porque ustedes en dos años hay que cambiarle esto por una cédula dominicana, uh -huh. naturalizarlo. Pero quedaron mucha gente que no se pudo inscribir. Sí, Entonces se tenía que saber dijo, quiénes son. Sí, dijeron eso en la noticia del 7, como a las 7 de la mañana. ¿Declaraste al niño? Yo ahora sí, yo fui ahora. ¿Y el papá del niño tiene cédula? Mira, el problema es el siguiente, que los descendientes de migrantes que fuimos declarados con ficha o pasaporte, le están dando ahora una acta de nacimiento nueva que se llama acta transcrita. Todo el que tenga su acta vieja, por favor, plastifíquenla y háganle copia. Porque es la única prueba que usted tiene de demostrar que usted estuvo declarado ya con anterioridad a la transcripción. ¿De acuerdo? Esto es oro, mamita. Yo terminé con estos dos barrancones, ya no me queda nadie. Entonces me queda nada más el barrancón de aquel lado.
Yo nací en un campo. Eran cinco hermanos y después nacieron otros dos pequeños. Mi mamá es de ascendencia haitiana, de cuarta, casi quinta generación, ¿no? Y papá, como migrante haitiano, era agricultor, se dedicaba a la recolección de café. En el batey, nosotros nos levantábamos a las cuatro o cuatro y media de la mañana para ir a vender comida a los trabajadores de caña. En el batey tú tienes comida segura seis meses, cuando hay zafra. Pero los otros seis meses tú comes una vez al día y es al final del día. Tuve que vivir eso. Este es el monumento de la restauración del Grito de Capotillo. Aquí fue donde se libraron una de las grandes batallas que ha tenido el pueblo dominicano de, de establecerse como pueblo independiente y soberano. Este es un país que ha luchado muy duro para mantenerse de pie. El séptimo personaje que tuve aquí en la Guerra de la Restauración, Pedro Antonio Pimentel Chamorro, fue el primer presidente constitucionalista en la transición de la restauración. Es el abuelo de mi abuelo. Es decir, el papá de mi mamá, por eso yo soy Feli Pimentel. Ya me casé con un negro. El papá de mis hijos era negro. Eh, tomaba mucho alcohol y en esa época yo era muy joven. Tú quieres a veces sostener eso, pero es, se hace insoportable. Entonces, por eso también vino nuestro divorcio. Eh, luego entré a de Derecho. Y yo soy experta en responsabilidad civil. En todas las luchas hemos estado ligados, en todas las luchas, incluso en la del 65, que era con los gringos, los haitianos participaron. Que los haitianos y los dominicanos siempre han vivido en confraternidad, ellos en su país y nosotros en el nuestro, a excepción de las veces en que ellos han querido meterse a dominar aquí. Y han sido batallas duras y difíciles. Nosotros acá, en, en esta isla, fueron llegando de distintas nacionalidades. Si analizamos el ADN de los dominicanos, es mayor el porcentaje de ADN africano que de otras nacionalidades. Pero lamentablemente, nosotros no queremos reconocer esa parte afro que tenemos. Después de correr el tanto, Moray me tuvo que descansar entre el cañaveral. Ella se durmió soñando con los cuentos que su mamá le contaba sobre su isla. se preguntó si volvería un día a ver su casa.
Tita, Tipa, Evolda, ¿cómo estás? Tranquilito. Y todavía bueno. te estoy conociendo. <risa> bueno, lo que resulta es que estoy invitando a alguien, no sé. No sé si a Fidel, si a. No, no sé. A Sadán. No, no, no quiero Sadán. No. Porque no me quiero ver con el problema. No me quiero ver con el problema de Sadán al final. Porque no, se, la hizo lo, se lo hizo a lo culto y al final la ella se ya, la ya. hizo a él. Venga la sed. Estoy en Haití, tierra de mi padre. Primera vez en mi vida. En Haití. En Haití. Una amiga. Juan Teófilo y yo somos primos. No es un afectado. Eh, al momento de hoy no ha podido resolver su situación. Él se fue para ver donde algunos familiares a Haití. Estamos en Veladero. Estamos en Veladero. Esta es la ciudad de Veladero. La más joven de Haití. Ay, pero no, no, no lo encuentro. Que es así. Uy, ¿usted va? No va a ir. Ok, uy, ¿usted va a ir? 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 Juan Teófilo nació en República Dominicana. Tiene cédula, pasaporte, ha viajado a Alemania, ha trabajado, tenía empresa, tiene dos hijos. Y de buenas a primeras le suspenden la vida. Hay muchas cositas que me hacen falta porque son, son propias mías. Me hace falta mi hierbita de calentura, mi hoja de dragón. Me hace falta mi oreganito. También en veces me hace falta el olor de la caña. Ahí fue que tú comenzaste a tener problemas. Ahí empiezan los problemas. Yo quería renovar mi pasaporte. Una copia de los documentos que yo entregué a, a, en la Junta, junto a... 15 documentos. Y... Sonia Javier Rivera, se llamaba tu mamá. Exacto. Fallecida ¿Y así? qué documento tenías de ella? Por ahí yo tengo el acta de difunción, que los, los fallecimientos y la, la edad no concuerdan. Hay que hacer una rectificación de, del acta de ella. Tu abuela tenía hasta su acta de nacimiento y todo. Tu abuela es dominicana y es la mamá de tu mamá. Exacto. Tu papá era el que era migrante. Exacto. O sea, que tú por you sanguine eres dominicano y también por you sol y por vía de tu papá. Que tú no deberías estar en esta situación. Todas estas pruebas que tú me estás aportando, copia de tu cédula, pasaporte, documento de tus padres, de tus hijos, todo lo que demuestra que tú has hecho toda una vida civil, como cualquier otro dominicano con tus documentos, pero no se entiende por qué la Junta suspendió, anuló tu registro. Entonces, eso es, es la parte más preocupante. Porque nunca me entrevistaron, nunca me preguntaron nada. Yo nunca ¿Tú supe nunca de... has ido a, un, a, a, un, a, una a una entrevista en inspectoría? Nunca, nunca. Lo primero que yo necesito es que la Junta me emita un informe de cuál es el estatus de tu caso en este momento. Eso es lo que me va a permitir a mí saber por dónde que debo accionar. Ok. ¿Me entiendes? Entonces, con todo esto que está aquí, yo haría una instancia, eh, solicitar una inspectoría, uh -huh. me den un informe de cuál es tu estatus en este momento. Exacto. Partiendo de ahí, cosa, cosa... yo te podría mantener informado. Ah, mira, me dijeron que la situación es esta. ¿Por qué? Eh, 
yo no puedo ir a hacer un procedimiento cuando viene a ver la Junta me sale con una zancadilla de que eso no es lo que hay que hacer. Es que, exacto. Sí, no, yo, yo estoy completamente Y como todo de esto es dinero y tiempo, es mejor entonces bailar al compás de ellos. Sí, ellos ponen la música y ellos no dicen cómo bailar. Ellos saben exactamente qué están haciendo. Un plan de desnacionalizar. O quizá un plan de un blanqueamiento, porque el asunto lo tienen mayormente con los negros, con los blancos no lo tienen. Y si hay un blanco con problemas es porque ha estado defendiendo a los negros. República Dominicana, la tierra donde yo nací, la amo y la quiero. Pero yo no quiero seguir viviendo con corruptos, con racistas, y no voy a vivir bajo la indiferencia de que soy un extranjero cuando yo nací allí. La desgraciada y maldita resolución 12, tan maldita la resolución como lo que la emitieron y lo que la firmaron, me fue llevando de la opulencia a la indigencia, allí en Consuelo. Si allí en Consuelo, donde saben quién soy, saben lo que puedo hacer, de lo que puedo ser capaz, me hacen la vida imposible, imagínate tú en otro lugar. Y más viendo tú que a Genaro lo están persiguiendo, a otro lo están persiguiendo, eh, ¿Quién me va a dar seguridad? El Estado. Cuando el Estado es quien me está persiguiendo. Tus hijos te esperan en República Dominicana, Juan Teófilo. Es tu decisión. Eh... Pero a, a mí me duele mucho a, este tipo de cosas. O sea, yo cuando fui a ver a los niños salí con... Con nostalgia. Con ese dolor en el corazón. Dicen que son la madre las que tienen conexión con los hijos de cierta manera, pero no. mis hijos y yo tenemos una conexión que cuando... Alguien le hace algo, ellos no tienen que decírmelo, yo lo sé. Yo recupero mi estatus y me servirá como un canal para yo irme a otro lugar y me llevaré a mis hijos. Vamos a tirar para adelante. Juntos podemos. And that was just the first 26 minutes of this moving work. Um, I will share with you after the conversation how you can watch the piece in its entirety. Everyone, please help me give a warm welcome to the editor-in-chief of the Haitian Times, Vanya Andre, and the film's director and producer, Michelle Stevenson. Thank you so much, Dana. It's a pleasure yeah. to see you, Michelle. Hi, good to Hi. see you. Thank you. Well, you know, first, I just want to say thank you so much for being here and, you know, especially for taking the time to create this film and tell the story about the plight of Dominicans of Haitian descent. Um, I think, you know, anyone who's been paying attention to the news over the past decade will agree that there's been a lot going on in Haiti, um, whether it's between the earthquake, Hurricane Matthew, um, political scandals, the TPS fight in Haiti, that it's easy to perhaps that this story could have gotten lost between that shuffle. So, you know, but before we move on and, you know, we talk about um, what's going on in present day um, Dominican Republic with the situation, I'd love if you can just share with our audience just a little bit about the history and the relationship between the Dominican Republic and Haiti, especially in the 30s and 40s um, under the Trujillo regime. I know that's a lot. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a lot. I mean, the whole the whole history. I think maybe it, it, it might be worth sort of talking a little bit even about our common sort of history, just to ground this this um, what's happening in the DR in Haiti uh, from a hemispheric lens. Like we sort of talk about Christopher Columbus arriving to America, but he never really set foot in North America, right? Although there is a day that um, that is uh, uh, commemorates it, but he did land on Hispaniola, on the island that currently is Haiti and the Dominican Republic, and it's where the first Europeans arrived in the Americas. It's where the first enslaved Africans arrived. It's also the first place where um, uh, the genocide against indigenous peoples happened, and from there, uh, a racial caste system was set up. Uh, based on color and race and origin that kind of spread as far north as Canada to as far south as Argentina. So we share a common origin story um, that is violent, um, but also resilient and uh, where there are populations of resistance, where we see now with Rosa Iris. And when we talk about the DR uh, in Haiti, it's interesting um, 
if you live around the border, you don't really sense a border. You sense a culture of Dominicans and Haitians actually living together and, 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 and having families together. But with the forces that exist, there is a, 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 an internalizing of white supremacy. There are uh, elites that have sought you know, cheap uh, labor from the Haitian side since the 1930s and earlier when they started the uh, plantation, uh, sugar plantation system. And the governments actually, in some ways, bought labor from the Haitian government and that was sort of the one of the first large waves of Haitian uh, migration uh, for work to labor in the in the plantations and sugar plantations, and part of that and and with that came um, extreme anti-blackness against the darker skinned Haitian population and their descendants, which was I'll say two things and then I'll I'll try to kind of wrap it up, which were um, sort of intensified with the U.S. occupation that happened during that time in the early 30s. Um, and they put in place a dictator, uh, a dictator Trujillo, who, um, who, who uh, uh, commanded the first sort of uh, massacre, uh, genocidal massacre against darker skinned Haitians, um, as well as uh, some darker skinned Dominicans fell to that massacre. And that is sort of commemorated in uh, what you have seen a glimpse of, the sort of magical realist tale of Moraime, uh, who represents that uh, a young girl from that time who was trying to flee uh, the violence that's being committed against her people uh, through the dictator. So when I talk about, when we talk about um, um, the tensions between the DR and Haiti, there are two tensions. One is there's always been collaboration and cultural sort of understanding and uh, living together, but there's always been this force, this white supremacist force that uh, instills senses of anti-Black hatred that um, many, you know, the governments and uh, powers that be have actually, you know, put in put into place and put in narratives um, that, you um, the larger population in some ways has internalized against Haitians. Mm -hmm. And at, I mean, thank you so much for, for tying that all in together. And I think that foundation is really important for those who are not familiar with the history of the region. And so as we've progressed throughout the years, you know, as time goes on, we see that there are more calls for like pro um, Africanism, for more of an embracing of your black heritage. And is that something that we've seen that's happened in the DR? Like how has that kind of progressed since that time to now contemporary time DR Haiti? So, um, so well, there, 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 are two, there, there are a couple of things happening, and I can make that uh, uh, as you have seen with Gladys Phyllis, who you see, you see her a couple of times, uh, or once, or twice actually, in this segment. Um, there is a very, there's a small but very powerful, moneyed, ultra nationalist right wing uh, uh, constituency that connects its white supremacist. Uh, um, um, agenda uh, to uh, the work of, of, of Trump and those who surround him to as far down as uh, Brazil, Bolsonaro, and she will actually discuss the connections that they have with those, uh, with those constituencies. And it establishes the interconnection and the fact that um, this uh, force, this ultranationalist force is global. But they are a minority, and I think that's important to note, but they have money <laughs> because there is there is an advantage to keeping, you know, darker skinned people in vulnerable positions and be able to be exploited, basically, you know, a modern form of, of slavery. But there is, I think, a growing sort of younger population of Dominicans and Haitians collaborating, people that I've come across, the crew that made up the production team with whom we were working that are very sort of identify uh, and connect with their blackness and African heritage, but also um, and are inspired by Haiti's history and, and Haiti's culture as well. And some have actually created collaborative organizations around culture. And even this sort of was spurred on uh, during the earthquake as well. 
So there, I, I, I like to think that that force is bigger, but perhaps less moneyed, right? Um, and I think the youth are slowly sort of shifting the narrative, but it's so deeply internalized. It's very, I mean, even in school, the way history is taught is, uh, is problematic. So I'm curious, you know, in your opinion, what do you think is one of the first steps or what should continue happen to be happening between the two cultures, the two countries to encourage more of the positive, more of the understanding of the shared history, the culture and to, to kind of foster that kind of community building? Because one of the things that was very striking to me while I was watching the film was a lot of that rhetoric that was coming from Gladys that was very um, representative and parallel of what we see, again, you mentioned here in the US with Trumpism, you know, the idea actually of physically building a wall between these two countries, this idea of keeping foreigners out. So, I mean, I definitely think that's one track that we've seen develop, but I too have seen, you know, the collaborative efforts between the two communities, especially during the, with the young generation. So I'm just curious, you know, how do we keep that going? Uh... I'm a filmmaker, not a politician or an activist, although I like to, my, my strength is storytelling and I can talk about it from that perspective. I think the idea of building these alternative narratives that people can, because I, I feel narrative is often at the core. It's not even a battle of facts that we're in, right? I can give you the facts, but if you don't believe my, what I believe, those facts mean nothing, you know? Uh, was, I've been doing some, uh, some work uh, are with this film with an organization called In Cultured Company, and they come from a conflict resolution perspective. And um, what what they've learned in the process, and they do uh, conflict resolution between Dominicans and Haitians, and put them all in the same room and do workshops. I think that kind of work is really significant. And there are cultural organizations, musicians and filmmakers that are creating collaboratives. But there is something at the very core that the folks at Incultured Company talk about. And, and, and I think it's very relevant to the United States also is you can't really start dialogue between groups without a common understanding of our history. An understanding, a, a common understanding of how the nations were built, what were the forces at hand? What kind of uh, uh, institutional sort of uh, uh, inequities were established in order to move forward? So we really have to start from the beginning. And what they do in In Culture Company, as an example, is go back to the history, like I was speaking about Columbus, you know, go back to how the island was, was established, what were the forces at hand, and gain that greater understanding from the very beginning. So it needs to start with, I think, that, that history. And I would say the same thing for us here in the United States, that with educate, which is why there is such a, a pushback against critical race theory, right? When we talk about uh, a re, imagining a re-understanding of our history so we all sort of have this common base, um, it's threatening. It's threatening to many who feel that it threatens their power. So it's about really starting at that base. And I think there is, there is a bubbling of that, as you said, with the youth around culture and around uh, re-education sort of. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, I think everything you said is extremely powerful, especially the part about going back to the history and then also tying in how that kind of creates um, stories and narratives, because we are a people that we live through storytelling from cavemen to now. So I think all of that intertwined, the education aspect of it, you know, the understanding and acknowledgement of either whether it's shared pain, shared joy, cultures, and then putting that all in narrative form is, is really important. Um, and, you know, I think we see that as a great example, specifically with um, the story of, of Rosa Iris, Iris and her cousin Juan. Um, that was very touching, again, to see these are two people that, I, from my perspective, they embody that shared culture history. Here are two people of Dominican, mm -hmm. of Haitian descent, being able to have this bicultural um, life. So if you can just talk a little bit more about, you know, the plights that, she went through and uh, trying to do this work and trying to repatriate Dominicans patients um, of descent and you know the challenges and maybe some of the successes that we that we were able to see or not see. 
Well, I think the biggest uh, challenge that Rosaidi's face, and I don't want to give away the whole film, is, uh, and then we see it here uh, uh, in the United States too, are the, the death threats on social media, right? Uh, as well as phone calls that she would receive, um, uh, threats to her life and to her family and to her son, um, which led to certain really painful decisions that she had to make. I'm not going to give up the, the, the whole film. You'll have to watch it to find out sort of what happens. But I think it further emphasizes the fact that uh, we are in a battle, you know, whether it's on social media, whether it's on the, uh, the news, whether it's, you know, in our own neighborhood and sometimes with our own families, right? Uh, the discussions that happen around uh, choices that need to be made. So I think that is sort of the biggest challenge that uh, Rosa Iris faces and has faced. Um, she herself, her documents were not in jeopardy, but, you know, she has uh, siblings who are, uh, who are um, uh, stateless and her cousin. Teofilo. So I think that's the biggest challenge for her. I think for Teofilo, um, it's very, it's existential, right? He is invisible. Um, so uh, I think that is the biggest pain. And in some ways, I see the, 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 the biggest extreme um, example of anti-Black hatred is to render someone invisible, right? To render them stateless. Um, and even when we think about in the United States and what citizenship means and how it was defined under the constitution directly related to race and who was a human being or not, it goes to our very humanity. And I think um, uh, the state and government recognizes that citizenship is about power and they wield it, right? Um, they reeled it around race and, and, and gender lines and uh, migration status uh, as well. Um, through. So I don't know if I'm answering your question, but I think if you take them to, I mean, Rosa is in a different position as a defender of, of human rights of her community. And Teofilo really represents the existential crises that, that, that uh, 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 stateless uh, uh, folks um, um, uh, suffer. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I would love um, maybe if you could give some details, a little bit of color on what life is like for someone in Teofilo's um, position in the Dominican Republic or in Haiti, um, moving through a society essentially being um, invisible. Like, what does that look like on a day to day basis, you imagine? Mm -hmm. Well, just imagine, you know, what it looks like. And, 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 and it's, it's sometimes hard to imagine because you know, in most of the Americas, uh, uh, governments recognize what is called birthright citizenship. You're born on the soil, you have a right, it doesn't matter who your parents are, you are American, right? Or you are Canadian, or, or even you, you are Haitian or Dominican, it's, it's, it's it written in the constitution, but it was changed as a result of this, uh, of this uh, constitutional court uh, decision. And what that means is uh, someone like Teofilo cannot, cannot uh, uh, own a mobile phone or, or have a mobile uh, phone service, cannot go to school, cannot get a job. Um, it's almost the reverse of being undocumented because you actually are born in the country where you are sort of uh, um, um, supposed to be sort of legitimately recognized at a, as a citizen. And so the minute you walk out the door, you are, uh, um, you are at, the, at the mercy of, 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 of the forces, of the police force, of, of the migration forces, of the state bureaucracies. They can do whatever they want with you. They can deport you, they can detain you, um, and you have no recourse. You can't, you don't even have recourse to what potentially another, to another country for support because they don't recognize you, right? So you belong nowhere. Uh, and this is how our global sort of uh, state apparatus is constructed. And that's why we talk about invisibility. Um, it's, you know, it, it was the case with the Rohingya in Myanmar. There are other people who are refugees in other countries who are stateless uh, as a result of, in some cases, standing up against the government. But in this particular case, it is a very deliberate, uh, uh, a very deliberate act of uh, anti-Black, uh, state-sanctioned anti-Black hatred uh, a move. So, you know, I'm curious, you know, you've mentioned a few other global examples of where this has happened. What usually is the way forward 
um, for these stateless people? Is it a situation where another country um, brings them in? Do they eventually resolve the conflict from their birth country? Because, you know, I'm thinking like, like what happens to a situation where that you have someone who was born and raised in Dominican Republic, um, speak Spanish, and then whether they are they self-deport or they're forcibly brought over to Haiti, you know, what what options do they have to even start building a life for themselves? Well, okay, there, there, there are a couple of things. So, so there's a big, it, I'll just take the DR as an example because I'm not sure what's going on. I mean, I, I know about the Rohingya and actually them being pushed out and uh, being stateless, but I don't have any details about that situation. In the case of the DR, um, there are ways um, for someone who finds himself in Haiti, if they have the money and the ability to uh, buy and purchase what they need in terms of proving their ancestry in Haiti, and sometimes it's about generations, you know, uh, of people uh, who may have parents who were born in Haiti, but they may not have their documents, they may not have their birth certificate uh, from that country. So it, it takes money and means uh, to be able to even get the documents that you need. The same goes for the DR. When the Constitutional Court came with its decision, where it basically made people you know, stateless from one day to the next, I had a birth certificate today, the Supreme Court decides, and tomorrow they decide, and uh, they, they make the decision today, and my birth certificate is no longer valid. So I can't get the job. I can't, I can't be recognized if I need to go to school and all of that. And they made it retroactive to my mother and my, 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 my mother's mother to 1929. And so there was such a huge international uproar about that because it made 200,000 people invisible at this point that the government put in these sort of I would say sort of gap measures where people who had birth certificates from the DR could find a way to register. They would be in a separate book though, which is which harkens back to, you know, um, Nazi measures of, of delineating Jews from Germans um, and are not really fully recognized as citizens, but they get a paper that allows them at least to find a job and to work. And this is sort of the gray area that Rosa Iris was working in. She says, okay, you can't get full citizenship recognized to the past. Maybe one day the law will change. I think we saw a little bit of that. So keep that birth certificate, however, you know, and, and, and make sure you keep it in case the law changes. In the meantime, let's see if you have enough papers so that I can get you something that can at least let you get a job. Right. Uh, and, and so those stopgap measures, and you'll see in the film, are at the mercy of the bureaucracy. Whoever I face, you know, in front of that office who decides whether they're going to give me that paper or not, it's really arbitrary. They, are, they hold the power about whether I'm going to get it or not. Do I have enough money to pay for it? You know, we were helping Teofilo uh, uh, try to get that stopgap measure papers. And every time he would go, it would be an, a, another hurdle and we would pay for that and then another hurdle and then we would pay for that and it became another hurdle until the whole team sort of uh, uh, gave up in the meantime. And so it's this mm -hmm. kind of Kafka-esque bureaucratic game of power uh, trying to use this little law that was established because of the international outcry that isn't even like full you know, citizenship recognition. Mm -hmm. I mean, that sounds like something that is beyond stressful to have to live day to day, um, having literally your future held in someone else's hand. And then essentially, whatever you are given, you're treated like a second class citizen in your own country. I mean, that's one thing that um, he mentioned all the time in the film is that he is being treated as a foreigner within his own country. Um, but, you know, I I'm going to switch gears just for a second. And um, kind of play devil's advocate because one of the um, points that you touched on, and it's an argument that, a counter argument that you'll see very right-wing nationalist um, advocates uh, say is essentially, well, a sovereign nation should have the ability to be able to dictate what constitutes someone being a citizen or not, whether it's birthright citizenship, whether um, it's something else. So I'm just curious, you know, what's your take on that? Are those arguments that you've held, um, that, that you've had 
people um, put to you or push back in your work? Well, I mean, Gladys, who you see, sort of has her own version of what, you know, uh, uh, a sovereign nation should do, but for me, that is the equivalent of a, of a totalitarian autocratic state. You know, this constitutional court uh, was appointed, uh, they're not elected, and they make a unilateral decision uh, uh, that goes against the constitution and referenda that were had. Uh, where is the due process of law, right? Um, and I think when we fall into legalities, it, it sometimes it, it masks the, the, the motivation beneath, even as we think about um, the, 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 the last four years that we spent where uh, the due process of law and the rights of people were being attacked consistently by by people who were in power who were using the law to legitimate you know uh what they're doing and right now here in the united states we have voting rights that are being uh attacked in the same way that the the, the birthright citizenship of folks that was recognized for decades uh uh is is taken away from one day to the next sovereignty is also about power right borders are about power and who is making the decisions, right? Who is it, and who is implementing the decisions, and who is the victim and suffering of those decisions? And uh, so, you know, sovereignty, uh, yes. But what about within that sovereign nation? Whose voice is being heard, right? And for us. Uh, across this hemisphere, uh, the descendants of enslaved Black people um, are at the center of, of, of the illegitimate uh, uh, moves of, 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 um, of anti-Black hatred that have to do with maintaining a certain uh, uh, group in society in power. Mm -hmm. um, when we had chatted earlier, you gave me a, a great example. I believe there was a um, either a protest or a demonstration supporting George Floyd that took place in the DR. Could you tell the audience a little bit about that? And I think that's a great example of what you've just mentioned about this idea of anti-Blackness that's still ingrained in a lot of places. Yeah, I think there are two sides to the coin when we talk about sort of global white supremacy and racial capitalism and how it manifests from as far, you know, Europe, you know, where it's, you know, the birthplace, France and England, you know, are the birthplace, Europe, uh, uh, Spain and Portugal of this uh, racial caste system that we sort of uh, have been this experiment here in the Americas and of which Gladys is sort of the modern formation of it, even though I, for me, I see her as a black woman, but there's a level of non of internalized oppression that is manifest there. Uh, and that's global, right? So, but there is the other side of it, which is our resistance is global, right? Our resistance, our solidarity is global. And it's necessary for us in this narratives that we build to really push that forward, that there are thousands of Rosa Iris, a, a thousands of black women in the DR doing the work as they are here in the United States, as they are in Brazil, risking their lives against these, this white supremacist uh, movement. An example that I give where these forces came, uh, came out ahead is, you know, as we, you know, with, with the murder of George Floyd, there was a, gl a global response, right? People actually reflecting in their own communities uh, in the UK, other places, you know, in Canada, understanding that George Floyd is me as well, is my community too. And the same happened in the Dominican Republic. And so the leaders of the organization that Rosa Iris is a part of, uh, led by Dominicans of Haitian descent, um, they put a commemoration to, uh, they wanted to put a memorial to George Floyd to commemorate, you know, uh, his death and the violence as uh, to, to be connected in solidarity. And they were arrested. Um, uh, Gladys's uh, uh, movement, her nationalist group, called the police, police came down and arrested the leaders of that organization because to them, that monument, that, that, that the, the wreaths, the flowers they were putting down uh, to commemorate George Floyd was a threat to them and to their power. 
very interesting. And, and again, for me, uh, it's a bit shocking, again, because the rhetoric is so similar to what we've heard here in America under Trumpism. And I can't help but think of how she would be received in this country. So it's the, the irony in all of that for me is, is, is really breathtaking. Um, so I'm curious, you know, where do things stand now in the Dominican Republic? Um, do you have an idea of how many Dominicans of Haitian descent have self-deported? Um, are there raids? I don't know if that's even the, the, the right um, terminology to use, but where does the ruling stand? I'm just curious in general, like if legal actions have been taken, anything of that sort. Uh, I'm not aware of, uh, so from what I've heard uh, is that you have the same number of people that are still in limbo and that it's really an arbitrary, as I explained early process of people who are able to afford to get that sort of gap measure that the government has uh, has put forth, uh, who can get that. Some people have, and others are just not able, they can't afford it. You have to have the money to be able to get all the documentation that 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 is required. And sometimes people don't even have the money to take the bus that is needed, the public bus, to get to the, to the, uh, to the main office in Santo Domingo. And if you watch the rest of the film, you'll see a, a, a bit of how that bureaucracy sort of uh, rolls out. And so people are, 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 in, are still in limbo. And from what I heard with COVID, it's just gotten worse in terms of the level of discrimination and attacks, the inability to get a vaccine. If you don't have the papers as someone who is born there, it's just been exacerbated. And on top of that, this new government has decided to build a wall now between Haiti and the DR, and they've started. Um, and so, um, if anything, from what I'm hearing, the situation has actually gotten worse for the communities. Um, I'm, I wasn't aware that they actually were moving forward with building the wall that's um, disheartening. And I think something that I hope that a lot of attention is given to over the couple of months, especially where I think what we may end up seeing in the in the coming year or so is a crisis you know, happening there, but then also questions about what's happening with Haitians who have TPS here in the US. So you know, I hope that a lot of attention is given to this. Um, so, but before we move over to the Q&A portion, I again just want to thank you for your work, for telling the story. Uh, over this past year, there's so much that's happened between the pandemic, um, the racial justice protests, and you know, I think your story and stories like this, they're so important. So that way we can all see this reflective in all types of mediums and platforms that there are so many diverse stories from diverse people that really should be told so we can really come to this place of understanding and reconciliation and be in a place for us to move forward. Thank you, thank you. No, you're welcome. Um, so we'll be taking um, a few questions from audiences in a few. Okay, everyone. Thank you so much, Vanya and Michelle, for that conversation. I have some questions of my own, but I'm not going to sneak them in, I promise. Um, and thank you to all of you out there who submitted your questions in no particular order. Um, I ha we have some, some really good ones here. Um, Sophia asked, the documentary mentioned discriminatory language through social media. Can you elaborate on how you see anti-Haitian rhetoric still affect Haitian people today who live who live on the island of Hispaniola. And I, I apologize, Sophia, if I, if I misread your question, but um, can, can, you, can you elaborate on how you've seen anti-Haitian rhetoric still affect Haitian people today who live on the island of Hispaniola? Well, they go from, uh, you know, the day-to-day the -day mundane microaggressions, you know, that mm -hmm. people also suffer here to uh, flat out, you know, discrimination. Even people who are legitimate residents, the darker your skin, the more the door is closed. So in some ways, it's a mirror to how it's enacted here, except the twist is sometimes the person discriminating against you might be just about the same tone, color, skin as you in some ways. Although, you know, there's there's some of that complication here in the, in, in, in the States as well. But there is so, so, so it runs the gamut, right, in terms of what it, how it's manifest. Um, and on social media, it's quite ugly, you know, 
um, the the level of uh, hatred and the and the um, spewing of, of of violence towards specific people, as with Rosa Iris. And you'll see examples of that um, in the uh, in the film. And you see that same thing happen here too on social media. People, you know, receiving really terrible death threats that um, that affect even how you uh, your your day to day existence. So it kind of goes runs the gamut from microaggressions when you're walking down the street, you know, to um, to trying to be able to get a job even if you have, you are legitimately you know there and also being exploited and 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 offered much less. Uh, pay because part of the issue also is there is a sort of this interest to keep a certain level of society at a really low labor cost. So I make that connection again. I'm, I'm sure many of us, many of us here, have gone to resorts, you know, in the DR mm -hmm. that all package really cheap resort to buy the beach. I don't have to worry about anything. I'm in this sort of space and I'm enjoying myself. Well, there's a cost to that, and it has to do with the people who are stateless, who are sometimes working for very little money, you know, cleaning the toilets, cleaning the rooms in those spaces, serving the food that allow your ticket, you know, to the DR resort to be as cheap as it is. And another thing about social media that always, a lot of those accounts or, you know, there's a there's a cartoon emoji or it's like a close up. You can't tell who it is. It's a private account. And it yes. and it makes for it's so much easier for, for a lot of this hate to be spewed. And, and you never know what to take seriously and whatnot. So you have to move with a certain level of caution. So I can't imagine how yes. scary that is. Um, Art asks, what inspired you to tell this critical story? Oh, well, that is my island. I was born in Haiti. My father is Haitian. Uh, my mother's Panamanian. So I have a very sort of uh, uh, ancestral sort of uh, draw to that and to the Caribbean. And uh, I, I, I grew up with this sort of love-hate relationship. I mean, my parents listened to merengue from the DR, Johnny Ventura and others. And I sort of grew up listening to music, dancing to that music, and with friends too who were Dominican, family who had married Dominicans, family who lived in the DR. But also I grew up uh, hearing the history and the stories of, of, of the tension between the two islands. Um, and so there was this love-hate relationship. And for me as a storyteller, I had just gotten off a very personal film that I had done that was about 13 years in the making and uh, wanted to turn to my roots um, in some way back to the island. And um, when the decision came down in 2013, um, I spoke with my partner at Rada Studio and we said, you know what, let's give it a shot and see, especially that it sort of is at the intersection of the work that we do around racial justice and storytelling and, 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 and narrative building. Thank you. Um, Brian wants to know, what did creating this film teach you about our obstacles to overcoming nationalism and colorism? <laughs> These are some heavy questions. Uh, yeah, that's the a heavy audience question. Come to play it's... today. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, you know, you know, there. I guess there are multiple levels. One is right. why I do what I do. Some of it is actually processing for me the actual pain mm -hmm. that uh, that is that heritage of, of of racial hatred, of colorism that I've seen in my family, but also how how I process it is through art, right, and through storytelling. And I think that's one thing on a very individual sort of uh, of level we can process it. I think another uh, another level is what Rosa Iris is doing and how inspiring she is and being able to you know broaden the platform of the work that she and others uh, are doing but I do think also it's a very individual sort of um, there's the collective work but there's also the work that we need to do ourselves to undo right to undo dismantle what we've internalized in the process and in our very relationships and sometimes that's all we can control um, right. And I think that that can have a ripple effect. But the first is to really be aware of what have I internalized? What is the baggage that I've internalized? How can I, what can I do to sort of change that in my, in, in, in my attitudes? And there was a second part to that question. Um, no? It was just, what did teach you about, uh, about our obstacles to overcoming nationalism? Oh, what the film, yes. And oh. mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So the nationalism part, I think part of what the film has has sort of displayed, I mean, the film was also about, you know, uh, the the inspiration that Rosaidis is, but also an understanding that I don't, we are not going to convince ultranationalists to change right, their right. mind. That there's just no way. It is a belief system. It's a, it's a it's a self fulfilling you know a uh, uh, almost religious belief. So mm -hmm. once we acknowledge that, we know that we have to build movement, right? Then that means we have to build movement, and it's it's the folks that we can connect to that we talk to. They're sort of in between, not quite sure, or maybe don't know the history the way they they could or expose. That's where the work needs to lie. But what that means is that more of us, you know, who 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 um, you know, who are who believe in justice, right, and who 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 have this 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 view that of things that need to change because of the inequities that exist, we have to we have to step up as as a larger group in terms of the things that we do. And stepping up is very individual, right? It's whatever you're capable of doing, but knowing that you have to be a little uncomfortable. You need to move, there, there has to be a level of discomfort for us to be able to make that change. And whatever you can tolerate is good. <laughs> also in the panel prior to the screening, um, I don't recall which one of our panelists said it, but there was, a, and I'm paraphrasing uh, a quote about your levels of wokeness and how it's, it's, it should always be evolving, wanting to learn more, wanting to yes. grow more. Um, and it just, and what you just said just now, that resonated with me. Um, from Michelle, not you, Michelle, but another Michelle. How does this film and its underlying story contribute to, to Haiti's current dilemma, if at all? Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I know you mentioned uh, politics, so I, and, but and so uh, so uh, but I'm not going to hold you too too your feet too close to the yeah. fire on this. One. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think so. Um, Here's what I'm, so for me, I had, there, there were a couple of intentions when we, th and I think it's for this film, it's more again about the imaginary. What do we imagine when we think Haiti, right? Mm -hmm. And for me, Moraime's story in this film, her, her, her search for freedom and Teofilo's very intentional decision to be in Haiti, in the mountains of Haiti. I see him as a modern day maroon, right? Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. this is an attempt as an, in a narrative sense to see Haiti as the place of freedom, right? This is a place, whatever its difficulties, accepts our blackness, right? And uh, whatever its, its, its flaws, right? Has paid a price for that since, since its independence. But that right. people like Teofilo uh, move toward, not as refugees, but as Maroons in search of freedom from oppression, right? And so for me, it's seeing the symbolism of what Haiti means and trying to shift that. And what I may also, her whole story is about getting to the other side of the island, because that is where she will be safe as a Black mm -hmm. woman, right? And so, so you know, it's that little sort of... Um, uh, drop in the sea to help us shift the notion of how we see Haiti. I mean, some people have written about Haiti being Wakanda, right? If we think about it, I mean, if we think about it in a certain way in the sense of the resilience, the resistance, the innovation, the creativity that exists in spite of being, you know, pushed on a daily basis because mm -hmm. of our global, of our global system. And so, I think from that sense, rather than be specific about the actual political situation that's going on now and what this story contributes, I think from a narrative and symbolic of space, we're trying to push how we how we see Haiti. Mm -hmm. How do we support Haitians and Dominicans in addressing these social issues regarding statelessness? What can we do? Um, well, um, there is there is a, a, a GoFundMe campaign that is happening now um, for the Legal Defense Fund in the Dominican Republic. There are a bunch. There are uh, attorneys uh, working there to defend the rights of Dominicans of Haitian descent to get their papers, as well as for Haitian migrants. And I don't know. I can certainly somehow maybe provide the link to that. Um, and in culture company, that organization I was talking about is sort of uh, coordinating and spearheading that initiative. So that's sort of a direct thing that can be done. But I think also just from um, 
individual, you know, social friend sort of uh, space, we can talk about it, right, to, to, to our friends and, and, and our family members, um, um, discuss the connections between what's going on there and what's going on here, but also, you know, eventually sort of talk about um, uh, the plight there. And I know that we're, we're, we're thinking about seeing if we can organize some kind of screening on Capitol Hill as well uh, to kind of influence um, the Foreign Relations Committee on thinking about ways of addressing uh, this, uh, this situation. What type of feedback, if any, have you received from those that were a part of the documentary since its release? Oh. <laughs> now that they're themselves on the big screen. <laughs> Well, I mean, Rosaides is uh, is really uh, sort of blown away by it, as is her son. Her son has watched it, and he's very, very excited when he sees. And he, you know, at the end of one screening we had, he was he, he went to his mother and explained how proud he was of her. So um, um, that's been great. And Rosa has actually been touring with the film as well, um, and doing uh, Q and A's um, uh, around the, the situation with the film. Um, uh, I recently heard from Gladys as well, who said that uh, my entire film is uh, full of lies. <laughs> oh. So uh, in spite of the fact that, you know, she says what she says in her film, but she's saying that all of this other, all the other narrative is not the truth, according to her, which is why I sort of talk about, uh, I talked earlier about the fact that you're not going to change people's minds. So that has been her her reaction, um, but overall, I think there's been, you know, it, interestingly, a lot of people have also come to us about. Um, we have sort of these post screening discussions, and people from uh, the Caribbean and the diaspora um, find that they have more tools also to kind of talk about colorism in, in their communities as well. Um, and we've had, so, so um, Teofilo, uh, unfortunately, ha I don't think he has seen the film yet. He's been ill. Um, he mm. had uh, two strokes uh, over the last two years. Oh um, and we've also sort of put some funds together to kind of help him with getting medicine, um, as well as, you know, trying to get him uh, some uh, papers as well. Um, but yeah, so that's been sort of uh, the overall reaction and the, the organization that um, uh, Rosa Iris is a part of called Reconocido, we're trying to organize a, a screening in, in the DR that will sort of help their movement. Thank you so very much. And, and you also kind of answered my last question. I was going to oh. ask, not that you share what happens in, in the, the rest of the film, because we, of course, we'll have the link for everyone to be able to watch it in its entirety. Um, but I kind of wanted to know, like, where are they now? So you, you touched oh. upon it. We're not going to give too much away. Um, thank you so very much, Vanya, for an, a compelling interview and Michelle for sharing your work um, with us here today and for taking time to answer audiences' questions and to sit with us. We appreciate you both so very, very much. And we are also going to put up on the screen the link where each of you who are watching today, you can see the rest of the film and or watch it with your friends and loved ones, the film in its entirety. Um, and we will also, I believe, have this information on the Walter Cates Foundation uh, website as well. Thank you so much, Vanya and Michelle. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Pleasure. We all have a story to tell. Beautiful, complex, fascinating stories. Told through a lens of varying shades and experiences. That's the power of art imitating life. It cannot be defined or confined to one space. So let your creativity soar. Fill the page, press record, and dare to captivate the masses with your authentic voice. We all have a story to tell. What's yours?